Bex, good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. Uh, we gather this morning to glorify our Father, our Holy God in heaven, and to exalt His Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, whom we worship today. Our goal is to see and savor the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So welcome again. Welcome specifically to any visitors who might be here. Uh, welcome to our, our guest preacher, uh, Pastor Corus van der Belt, um, who was a long time uh, um, pastor at Three Hours Baptist, and he's now retired and worshipping at Brackenhurst. So we welcome him, his, his wife, Jan, and their two grandchildren were not able to be with us this morning. Uh, they're not feeling so well, the grandkids, so we, we will pray for them. But we welcome you. Thanks so much for being here this morning. Um, particular welcome to any visitors who might be with us. I see uh, the, the cold, or maybe the Father's Day celebrations have have uh, affected, but maybe some more people might come just now. The food is going to be good, to be good later. Um, just to remind you, the prayer meeting is this afternoon, 1715, uh, the evening service as usual at 1800, and all Sunday school classes are in recess, uh, as you know. So welcome. Our scriptural call to worship this morning I've taken from 2 Corinthians. No need to turn there, just listen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the same comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Let us stand and, in fact, sorry, there's one more announcement. Uh, just to remind her, as uh, PJ has uh, given me some information about the ESV Bibles, um, our brother Mark Hope can get them directly from the States at excellent prices, apparently. And there will be a few samples with approximate prices from next week. So we'll be able to give people a few weeks to look at those before putting in that order. Bibles ordered this way will take a month or two to arrive. Both days, there's a whole long list. So 16th was Neil Neely and Don McLaughlin. 17th, Agnes George. 18th, Liesl Pugger. Is Liesl here today? Is the hand? Yes, well, happy birthday to you for today. Uh, tomorrow, Leslie Richardson, another Leslie, Leslie Curry on the 20th, Tracy Pegger on the 21st, and the 22nd, Tabo Matsi. So there's a whole bunch of people, and we just celebrate you. Please do wish them happy birthday when you see them. I uh, this morning, I first hear, um, what is our hope and, and life, in life and death? So let us ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Let us worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. So please stand and let's sing with gusto.
to our musicians. So it was remiss of me not to wish the fathers amongst us a happy Father's Day. Um, I always used to tease my folks um, when I was growing up. But the Father's Day is not about the fathers, because for me as an eldest son uh, of six kids, I used to say to my mom and dad, well, Mother's Day actually is my day, because I'm the first child, and so therefore you wouldn't have been a mom or a dad, and this for me. So, if, in fact, I would say to the journey that it's your day today, and so uh, just uh, say well done to your dad and your mom that they made you who they are. Please let's bow our heads as we come before the throne of God. Oh God Almighty, we praise you, heavenly, holy God, our Father. We marvel at your glory and your mercy and your grace. As a father has compassion on his children, so you, Lord, have compassion on those who fear you. We praise you, Father, for you have provided everything we need according to your will and your good pleasure. We display every day the ultimate father role model to us. Help those here who are fathers to become better at the responsibility you have blessed us with. Father, we praise you and we thank you for the fathers here uh, and for the mothers and the children who make them such. Father God, help us to love you with all our hearts and our souls and our minds and our strengths. Help us to fear you, Lord, to serve you, to worship you, to obey you, and in so doing, to please you and to seek you, and therefore to know you more. We acknowledge, Father, that is, it is only by the crucified blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, which allows us to approach you, Father. For we are not only worthy, or for, for we rather are only worthy by virtue of the imputed righteousness of Christ, nothing of our own. As you loved your son, help us to love like that. As you love us, help us to love like that. As Jesus loved his church, help us, Father, to love our wives in just the same way. Help the fathers to provide and protect our wives and our families by the enabling power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to please, to pardon, to praise and to prosper our wives as Christ does for the church. Help us to Father God Almighty to bless our children, to direct them, to discipline them, and to direct them. Help us to rely on your Holy Spirit to enable us by your grace and to be godly husbands to our wives and godly fathers to our children. Forgive us, Father, when we are prayerless and self-reliant, when we have little time for our wives or our children, when we are conceited, unkind, unsensitive, hurtful, when we show no compassion, when we discourage, when we provoke our children, when we don't bring up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Forgive us when we don't confront evil, when we are lazy and barely livid. Help us to earn the trust and respect of our families. Forgive us when we demand it. Help us to model forgiveness, confession, and contrition, trouble, and sanctification. Grant us an integrity and a character that is hot, that is Holy Spirit powered, God glorifying and Christ exalting. For we cannot whatsoever do this on our own. Help us, enable us, each of us, to do the privileged job you have given us, and to do it well for your glory. We pray all these things in the loving name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who also calls you Father. Amen. Let's make a joyful noise to our Lord. Let's serve the Lord with gladness. Let us come into his presence with singing. Know that our God is good. Let's sing and sing the next stand and sing the next hymn. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's stand.
Special good morning to the children. And we're going to begin with the normal verse from last week. It was Numbers chapter 21, verse 8. I hope you remember it. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and know. Well done. Well done. And so, what is today? Two chains there, right? Yes. But something else as well. What, are, what is today? Father's Day. That's what Uncle Mark was saying. And why is that important? Why is that important? Their Father's Day. Yes, yes, why is it important? <laughs> because your dad's important, right? That's what you were saying to him. Fathers are important. Or more specifically, the relationship between fathers and their children is important. So what Uncle Martin was teasing his, his mom and dad about is, is, is largely correct, right? It's about the relationship between moms and dads. It is so, it's so important as the relationship between fathers and their children that it's one of the most important illustrations that God uses to illustrate the relationship between us and him. So the Bible has a lot to say about the way fathers should deal with their children and the way that children should treat their fathers. And I'm going to read to you from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for that is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment of the promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So children, from this verse you can see that you have a job to do. In fact, you've got two jobs to do. Two jobs that are quite similar and tied to each other. And what are they? Come on, what are they? Yes. Okay, to obey mom and dad, and to honor them. That's right. And the best way to honor them is by obeying them. And when you obey them, oh, yes, it's obeying them quickly and cheerfully. And do you know what? God promises to bless your obedience. This is the first commandment of the promise. God promises to bless your obedience. And fathers, we have a job to do. A job that's more subtle and sophisticated, as it should be. Right? Because we have to be the adults in the relationship. And so it's stated negatively and positively. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And fathers, God will bless your obedience. Now, children, you have to come and help me. Because there's a small way that we want to honor the fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers here. So please come up, children, and help me. You know the job with all the dads and granddads and great-granddads. Please stand. And when you've received the chocolate, you can sit down again. But when you think you've received enough chocolates, you can sit down again. <laughs> okay, go distribute, please. Thank you. There we go. All right, come back and get some more if you need to. All right, until all the dads and granddads are seated. Looks like we're nearly there. Okay, I think I think we are okay. Okay. There we go. 
think we've done them all. But right. And remember, we shouldn't just give our dads chocolates. We should honor and obey them. And dads, let's uh, raise our children in the fear of the Lord. Our scripture reading. Thanks so much, PJ. Our scripture reading this morning is going to be read by our brother Graham Funnel uh, from Psalm 38. So as he's coming up, you can go to Psalm 38, verses 1 to 22. This is a psalm of David. The only person that I know of in Scripture who it was said of him that he is a man after God's own heart. So listen as he pours out his heart to the Lord during this particular stage in his life. We're not quite sure when it was that he, he wrote this, but the words of this psalm are very, very important for us to understand and to feel confident that when we are going through trials and problems, that we can go to God and just pour out our heart. This is a unique, a unique way of just being able to speak to the Lord and just not be afraid to hold anything back whatsoever. So let us read together this morning the song of David. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk deep in, into me, and your hand has come down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate all the day I go about mourning. For my sides are filled with burning and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. O oh Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs. My strength fails me. And the light of my eyes, it has also gone from me. My friends and my companions stand aloof from my plague. And my nearest kin stand far off. Those who seek my life lay their snares those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. But I am like a deaf man. I do not hear. Like an old man who does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear and who in whose mouth are no rebukes. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord my God, I will answer. For I said, only let them not rejoice over me, nor boast against me when my foot slips. For I am ready to fall, and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. But my foes are vigorous. They are mighty. They are many are those who, and many are those who hate my, me wrongfully. Those who rendered me evil for good accuse me because I follow after good. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, do not be far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Hear the word of the Lord this day. Thanks so much, Graham. If you can just say amen to that. Our final prayer before our final hymn, before Brother Kerbis comes to 
deliver the message to us. So let us give thanks to our Lord for his good and his love endures forever. Please bow your heads as we pray. Holy Sovereign, Creator God, we thank you for blessing us with a church where we can hear your word proclaimed, where the gospel message points us every single week to Jesus Christ and in turn to our salvation. We seek you this morning, Father. Meet with us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, you have commanded us to make disciples. Your word exhorts us to build ourselves up in the faith and to use our gifts to serve others. Please help us and enable us to do these things. Your word also tells us to speak the truth in love so that your church will become more mature. Please grant us wisdom and boldness and all the fruits of your spirit to do all these things. Help us, bless us, build your church, Lord Jesus. Build your church here at EBC and in our country and indeed across our nation and the globe, we pray. Help us to grow in loving our church just as you, Lord Jesus, love your church and how you love our church. Just as you, holy, all-loving, all-wise Father, have shared everything with us, so too help us to do the same. We pray by the enabling power of your Holy Spirit that we display your glory to the community and the nation around us. Help us to fix and focus our gaze on the gospel of Christ, to trust him for our salvation and to love one another with the unity and, and love only uh, that love that only you can infuse within us. Help us to be convinced enough, bold enough, confident enough, assured enough, amazed enough, passionate enough, and caring enough to be compelled with delight and with zeal to share this gospel with others. Forgive us, Father, when we are lazy and idle and ap apathetic. Forgive us for our indifferent attitude to evangelism, where we fail to exploit every opportunity presented to us to proclaim your gospel of your grace, almighty loving God. Father, if we were truly overwhelmed and overawed by your love and your grace on the one hand, and then simultaneously on the other, fearful and awestruck by the power of your righteous wrath on the other, we would not be able to contain our gratitude and our desperation to share this life-saving gospel. You know our needs long before we do, Father. We bow before you, utterly dependent on you for everything. We pray now specifically for folk in our in our midst, we pray for Marco and Laura and for a special peace and, and presence and just healing and the power of, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Strengthen them during this difficult time and we just help them. We, we pray that you help them to focus on your love in the midst of, of the pain and just help those around uh, all of us here to support them in whatever way we can. We pray for traveling mercies for Barry Fenter who will be flying back from Saudi at the end of the month. Please return him to us and his family safely. We pray for Ayanda and the Kamala family, where Ayanda is far from his family, but trying to serve them with all he has. Please bless him and his family. We pray for all families in our church, all marriages. We pray that from the overflow of our hearts, words will build up and not tear down. We pray for a long list of folk who are struggling with illness. We commit all these to you, Belinda Glover and the rest of the Glover family, Rick's daughter Christelle, Leslie's sister, and then all the names in our bulletin that we are just reminded about. Lee and Kay, Don and Eileen, Joy, Charmaine, Lucretia, Josh Wenzel, Mark Walters, Trish, Sue, Jean, Frida, Dave and Betty. Father God, please bless them and just empower them and heal them and restore them and help them to focus on you rather than on their circumstances. We pray for our brother Kobus van Avalt, who is preaching this morning and we are so grateful for for him being here, we thank you for him. We, we pray that you just bless him richly as he shares your truth. Help him to do this clearly and with divine Holy Spirit-guided understanding and boldness. We bring all these before you, Father God, uh, only by the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A final hymn. Uh, my heart is filled with thankness, thankfulness. So one last time, let us sing and make music from our hearts to our Lord. Please stand.
Good morning to everyone. Um, thank you for the in invitation to come and share the Word of God with you this morning. It's really a privilege for me to do that. Um, let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, we come this morning in the name of our Lord and uh, Jesus Christ, and we come with humble hearts, seeking your guidance and wisdom as we prepare to hear and preach your word. We ask that you will open our minds and hearts to receive your message and to be transformed by the, the word. And may your spirit fill this place this morning and may your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved, one of the most intense battles in my personal spiritual life, if not the most intense, is the struggle with thoughts and feelings of unforgiveness. It revolves around that one or two or even three sins from the past, sometimes spanning decades, where I feel that the Lord either did not, does not want to, or even worse, cannot forgive me. The old Puritan minister, Richard Baxter, cautioned about the emotional toll of carrying unnecessary guilt, stating, sorrow, even for sin, may be excessive. That excess sorrow consumes a person, making them feel as though they are drowning in guilt. Does this resonate with you? Are you also grappling with sins from your past? Now let's open our Bibles and explore Romans 7 to get God's perspective on these barriers and struggles. Let's turn to Romans 7. We'll be reading from verse 14, and I'm reading from the ESV. Romans 7, verse 14. Romans 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want. Sorry, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Now to provide some background and context. Let's briefly explain the, pre uh, the preceding paragraph, that is Romans 7, verse 7 to 13. And in this passage, all the verbs are in the past tense. 
indicating that Paul is referring to his position before his conversion, when he encountered the law of God. And it's important to remember that Paul, as a Pharisee and a knowledgeable uh, student of the Old Testament, had a deep understanding of the law. A deep understanding of the law. And the Pharisees who were known for their strict adherence to the law even added additional regulations to the written law, resulting in over 600 and even more laws that they expected all Jews to adhere to. Now, as we dwell, delve into the exposition of Romans 7, verses 14 to 25, we will discover that Paul has come to realize that any attempt to keep the law leads to works and bondage, which is contrary to righteousness. And furthermore, we will see that when we are liberated from striving to keep the law, our lives can be marked by spirituality. This means putting into practice the beliefs of the Christian faith, encompassing both knowledge and action. In James 1 verse 5, for example, states, But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now let's focus on verses 14 to 23 where we will explore the concept of our burdensome baggage. And then we will move on to verses 24 and 25, which discuss how we can be rescued from that baggage. In the preceding paragraph, that is Romans 7, verses 7 to 13, Paul teaches us that we have been transformed and made new through Christ Jesus. He emphasizes that our old selves were crucified with Christ, rendering sin powerless over us. We are no longer enslaved to sin, for those who have died with Christ have been set free from this grasp. Romans 6. Additionally, in verses, uh, verse 14, Paul declares, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. And furthermore, in various passages, such as Romans 1 verse 6 and 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, Paul greets the believers as those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. He affirms that we, as believers, are holy. We are holy. However, however, there is still an ongoing conflict. And this struggle between our sinful nature and our holiness can often lead to confusion, resulting in emotional and spiritual baggage. Many Christians find themselves grappling with this baggage, hindering their journey with the Lord and their pursuit of sanctification. Paul too experienced this conflict as he confesses in verse 15, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And for his personal experience, it is evident that there is an inner battle within him. The deepest and most genuine part of him desires to do what is right, but something hinders him from doing so. Now, the question arises, does this conflict exist in unsaved individuals as well? According to Jeremiah's words in Jeremiah 17 verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The unsaved, beloved, do not echo this sentiment. That sentiment that's echoing 
in our reading, stating in verse 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do good, or the good I want. So Paul acknowledges that there is a deep part of him that desires to do what is right. And I dare say that this conflict is something experienced by every Christian. Furthermore, we observe that Paul struggles with the opposite type of sin. He finds himself doing things he does not want to do. His frustration is twofold. In the first place, he fails to do things he desires to do. Verses 14, 15, and 16. And secondly, he engages in actions he does not want to do. Verses 7, 15, and 16b. And in verses 17 to 20, he recognizes the complete corruption of his own sinful nature. While in verses 21 to 23, he comprehends the daily struggle within him. That struggle in verse 21, verse A, or verse 21, A, and verse 23, the old nature constantly inclines toward wrongdoing. We all know that. We experience that daily. And secondly, the new nature continually seeks to do what is right. Following the description of the believer's struggle with the flesh, Paul emphasizes that believers are not without hope for deliverance. Can I say that again? Paul emphasizes that the believers are not without hope for deliverance. The ultimate answer is found in verse 25 and more specifically in Romans 8. So what does all of this mean for practical application? Simply put, in our new position before God, having died to the law, we are not expected to obey God solely by our own strength. We cannot do that. That's impossible. God has not bound us under a quote-unquote Christian law that we must adhere to in order to be holy. Instead, He has bestowed upon us the Holy Spirit who empowers us to fulfill the requirements of God's holiness. While we as Christians may experience victory as described in chapter 6, and are no longer enslaved to the flesh, there is more to the Christian life. Much, much more. Shouldn't we bear fruit for God? Absolutely. However, the moment we rely on our own efforts, we discover our own failures. Unfortunately, many well-intentioned Christians stop at this point and become spiritual casualties. And instead, we should embrace the truths presented in Romans 7, acknowledging our inadequacy in ourselves, recognizing the goodness of the law, and then allowing the Spirit to, do, to work out God's will in our lives. May God grant us the ability to consider ourselves dead to sin, according to chapter 6 of Romans, and dead to the law, according to chapter 7 of Romans, so that through the guidance of the Spirit, we may experience the blessed freedom of being God's children and bring glory to Him through holy living. Paul expresses deep anguish, when he explains in verse 24, What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? However, in verse 25, he reveals the solution 
to this agony, proclaiming, Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Brothers and sisters, as believers, many of us have a theoretical understanding of what it means to be forgiven. We comprehend that Christ's death has atoned for our sins. By placing our faith in Him, we are saved and enter into an eternal relationship with Him. And that remains unchanged. Even though we may still sin after becoming a Christian, we know that when we approach the Lord with a repentant heart, confessing our sins to Him, He cleanses us and forgives us. And first, John assures us that when we confess our sins, 1 John 1 verse 9, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we must keep this in mind. Now, I mentioned earlier the words of Richard Baxter, who stated that when Christians are unable to rid themselves of a guilty conscience regarding sin or certain sins, guilt will consume them. And they may feel and will feel as they are drowning. Now, this guilt also obstructs and frustrates their sanctification, negatively impacting their relationship with the Father, their prayer life, the study of the, of, of the Word, and even their interactions with fellow believers and non-believers. And regardless of how often these believers confess their sins, they feel unforgivable. They believe that sins such as divorce, abortion, and adultery are beyond God's forgiveness. They continue to carry the burden of guilt like heavy baggage on their backs, weighing them down each day. And perhaps you are currently struggling with carrying this baggage feeling like you are sinking in sorrow and regret. What might be hindering you from experiencing forgiveness and moving on from your past? What is it? What must we do as believers to rid ourselves of such a guilt or guilty conscience and the baggage of our past? Here are some barriers that may prevent us from feeling forgiven. The first barrier, what I have done is so bad. I know that God is forgiving, but I cannot be forgiven for this. God cannot forgive that sin in my life that I committed 25 years ago. This belief suggests that Christ's death was not enough to pay for all sin. It implies that His atonement covers the sins of the rest of the world, but not this particular sin. However, this conviction is far from the truth and constitutes sinful unbelief. Sinful unbelief. Scripture declares in Acts 2 verse 21, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Without exceptions. Our sin is not worse or better than the sins of others. And Christ's death is sufficient to cover all sins. All sins. A second barrier, I must punish myself for my sins to be forgiven. It is natural for us to desire to pay for our sins. We may find a strange sense of satisfaction in being punished. 
or even punishing ourselves for our wrongdoing, for our sins, for that unforgivable sin. We may believe that our guilt and self-rejection is our necessary penance to regain God's favor. However, personal pain adds no value, no value to Christ's sacrifice. Our forgiveness came at a high cost to the Lord. And this sacrifice is sufficient to pay for our sins, for all our sins, even for that particular sin from 25 years or 30 years ago or last night. We cannot supplement or add to Christ's sacrifice. We can never do that. A third barrier, and I think this is a barrier that all of us know well. We hear it regularly. I know God has forgiven me, but I cannot forgive myself. By claiming that, by claiming that we cannot forgive ourselves, we elevate our judgment above the Lord's judgment. Beloved, Scripture never instructs us to forgive ourselves. Never. When we attempt to forgive, quote-unquote, ourselves, we are attempting the impossible. We are the offenders. And it is God who has been wronged by our rebellion and sins. Therefore, He is the only one who can and must and will forgive. A fourth barrier. Because I'm still experiencing the consequences of my sin, God must not have forgiven me yet. It's a common mistake to, uh, and, uh, and the natural consequence for God's punishment. That's how we reason many a time. For instance, if you jump off a tree and sprain your ankle, it's not God causing your ankle to twist as a form of punishment. Gravity simply drew you back to the ground. And your pain is a natural consequence of your action. Similarly, sins for which we are forgiven long ago, uh, ago may still have lingering consequences in our lives. However, that does not necessarily mean it is God's punishment. According to Romans 5, verse 9 to 10, God saves us from His wrath through Jesus. Romans 5, 9 and 10, Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we re were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Beloved, our punishment has been paid in Christ. As believers, we are forgiven for our actions and precious to the Lord, even when consequences from these actions remain in our lives. A fifth barrier. I did not repent enough. John states in 1 John 1 verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now the Greek usage of the verb confess, metanoia, here indicates a one-time occurrence. Only God can assess the sincerity of our confession. And He never requires us to repeatedly repent for the same sin over and over and over again. If you repented in sincerity, it is done. So, what should we do with guilt? 
what should we do with baggage? First, we must understand guilt from God's perspective. When we sin, it is normal to feel remorse. This is the purpose of our God-given conscience. In our journey through life struggles and pain, we must wholeheartedly embrace the teachings of Scripture on forgiveness. Genuine forgiveness is available to all people, satisfying our deepest desire to be cleansed both internally and externally. Through Christ, all our sins have been paid for. God's plan is for our sorrow or guilt over our sin to lead us back to Him. That is the purpose, to lead us back to Him. He desires that we turn away from that sin, seek forgiveness from Him and those who have, uh, we have hurt, make amends when possible, and then move forward with Him. We must let go of that sin, leaving no room for regret as we continue our journey with the Lord. Christ wants to rescue us from the baggage of our past. And He truly does so. If all this is true, what we should do is turn to God and repent of our unbelief that He has full, full and forgiven us. We must ask Him to forgive us for our lack of faith and renew our minds. As Romans 12 verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And we can also pray Psalm 51 verse 10 to 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of our salvation, and uphold with me with a willing spirit. Use this, these verses as a place of refuge and strength until you receive healing and are freed from the burdens of your past. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you will help us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds. We also ask that you will free us from the burdens of our past. Help us to believe that Christ's righteousness was imputed into us, that we are freed from our sin once and for all. Help us to come to you in sincerity when we confess our sins and help us to throw down the baggage of past sins that you've already forgiven. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand up and conclude with the last hymn. Uh, I can't remember the name, the title now. All I have is Christ. Let's stand up.
as you remain standing, receive the benediction from the Lord. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen.